Stories from the pages of time. Stories of triumph and tragedy, adventure and achievement as we go in search of history. Just three years after his triumphant return from the Lewis and Clark expedition, Meriwether Lewis is dead. The body of the renowned explorer and governor of the Louisiana Territory is found in the wilderness. What happened to this protege of Thomas Jefferson? The sparks of controversy still fly today. The weight of evidence still bears on the fact that Lewis committed suicide. Why would this talented man, a hero, take his own life? Some don't believe it. I simply think there is enough evidence to justify going forward with a hypothesis of homicide. Come with us in search of history as we investigate the death nearly 200 years ago of Meriwether Lewis, suicide or murder. Late afternoon in October of 1809, a lone rider moves along the Natchez Trace. His destination? A rude cabin in an isolated wilderness some 70 miles south of Nashville. There he receives a hesitant welcome from the owner of a backwoods inn called Grinders, or sometimes Griner's Stand. These are the last documented moments in the life of the famed explorer Meriwether Lewis. The man who, with William Clark, led America's core of discovery across a new continent from the Mississippi to the Pacific Ocean has come to the end of his final journey. He is 35 years old. On October 28th, William Clark, who knows Meriwether Lewis better than any man alive, writes an anguished letter. Today I saw a report which gives me much concern. It says that Governor Lewis killed himself by cutting his throat with a knife. I fear this report has too much truth, though it may have no foundation. I fear that the weight of his mind hath overcome him. Clark finds only contradictory news stories based on word of mouth. Some mention knife wounds, others gunshots. Some say Lewis was alone. Others that he was traveling with a small party. Yet one rumor is consistent, that Meriwether Lewis, governor of the Louisiana Territory and one of the men responsible for opening the American West, has taken his own life. It's hard for us today to imagine just what heroes uh, Lewis and Clark were. Uh, they were wined and dined all around the country. The biggest heroes since the American Revolution. I guess the easiest way to compare this is when uh, the astronauts came back, when John Glenn landed, uh, when Charles Lindbergh landed, uh, the sort of adulation for these men and the sort of triumph of the country. I think when people look at the death of Meriwether Lewis, uh, they want to know what drove him to this point. He had accomplished this great expedition. Everyone was lauding him and praising him. He had a great job as governor of Louisiana. What's the problem? What's gone wrong here? The few sketchy facts are quickly established. The governor left St. Louis by boat on September 4th, 1809, on his way to the federal offices in Washington. A little over a week later, he is at Fort Pickering near Memphis. Captain Gilbert Russell, the commander of the fort, reports that Lewis is ill. After a two-week stay, the governor sets off again, this time traveling overland. The first leg of the journey is along an old Indian trail known as the Natchez Trace, running from Natchez on the Mississippi to Nashville on the Cumberland River. It is a distance of about 550 miles through a wilderness with few way stations. Lewis does not go alone. He leaves Fort Pickering in the company of Major James Neely, the Chickasaw Indian agent 
and the man's black servant. Lewis also has a servant with him, John Pernia, a man of French or Spanish extraction who has been with him for some time. Along the way, they may have been joined by several Indians from the Chickasaw Nation. They crossed the Tennessee, and one day's journey north of the Tennessee, while they were camped, two of their horses strayed. Major Neely, the next morning, stayed behind to find the horses. And that's why Meriwether Lewis was alone when he pulled in to Grinder's stand. The inn consists of only a few rude one-room cabins separated by a short open passageway. Lewis is given a room by himself. The servants, when they arrive, retire to the barn. When Neely reaches the stand the next morning, Lewis is dead. The governor is given a hasty burial on the edge of the property. Neely goes on to Nashville. There, he writes to former President Thomas Jefferson, who has known Lewis since childhood and is his longtime friend and patron. It is with extreme pain I have to inform you of the death of His Excellency, Meriwether Lewis, who died on the morning of the 11th of this month, and I'm sorry to say, by suicide. Neely passes on a story he says he heard from the innkeeper, Mrs. Grinder. The woman reports that about three o'clock she heard two pistols fire off from the governor's room. The servants being awakened by her came in, but too late to save him. He had shot himself in the head with one pistol and a little below the breast with the other. When his servant came in, he says, I have done the business, my good servant. Give me some water. Jefferson seems to accept the story as fact. So does William Clark, who never publicly questions the report. It is August of 1813. The body of Meriwether Lewis has been buried beside the Natchez Trace, far from his homeland in Virginia, for more than three years. Thomas Jefferson, now in his 70s, searches for a way to explain the violent and untimely death. Governor Lewis had from early life been subject to hypochondria afflictions. It was a constitutional disposition in all the near branches of the family. Jefferson had known the family for years. He followed Lewis's career in the army and in 1801 chose the young officer to be his secretary. A year later, Lewis and a friend from his army days, William Clark, are given the assignment that will become the adventure of a lifetime and ensure their place in history. Lewis could, was very capable under these sort of circumstances when he had a clear sense of what he had to do, when he had people who were dependent upon him as a leader and that he had to take charge and be in control of himself and therefore uh, the situation was perfect for his personality. And then too he had Clark with him and their personalities meshed perfectly. The expedition comes to a successful conclusion in the fall of 1806. As a reward, Lewis is named governor of the territory of Upper Louisiana. Clark becomes the territory's agent of Indian affairs. Lewis and Clark are the guests of honor at the social events of the season and have their portraits painted by the leading artists of the day. But there are personal matters to attend to as well. And here, Lewis and Clark take very different paths. Clark uh, uh, went to Virginia, where his home was, and uh, he went back to a woman that he had uh, some romantic inclinations toward. And uh, he, he married Julia Clark during this period. Lewis was doing something of the same thing. He was also looking for a partner uh, for his career and his life. Lewis seemed to be unlucky in love. He seemed to uh, have relationships with women, uh, proposing to them, dating them, going to, to balls and banquets, but never seemed to uh, settle into any sort of a long-lasting relationship. Lewis, in a letter, expresses his frustration. I am now the perfect widower with respect to love. I feel all that restlessness, that inquietude, that certain indescribable something to old bachelors, which I cannot avoid thinking proceeds from that void in our hearts, 
which might or ought to be filled, I never felt less like a hero than at this present moment. With Clark married and already at his post, Lewis continues to delay, moving restlessly from town to town. The year after his return, 1907-1908, is sort of a lost year. It's a lost year because we don't know a lot of what Lewis is doing. We know he's sort of up and down the East Coast, around the big cities. He's being feasted and celebrated because of his return. But it's also a lost year because he isn't getting back to the job he has in St. Louis as governor of Upper Louisiana. Now, there are things happening there, and there are things that are going to happen uh, with Lewis that come back to haunt him later. One looming problem is with the man acting as governor during this time, the territorial secretary, Frederick Bates. From the start, he has an uneasy relationship with Lewis. Bates uh, may have been a competitor with Lewis for the job of governor of Upper Louisiana, and therefore, Lewis had to uh, be the supervisor of a person who had been the former competitor for his job. Not a good employee relation situation for Lewis and Bate. By the time Lewis finally assumes his office in March of 1808, Bates is well established. Bates and Lewis clash over policy issues almost immediately. Bates began, after a time, uh, to write letters back to administrators in Washington complaining about Lewis's activities. So he was very much uh, sort of uh, stabbing Lewis in the back. Instead of taking him up directly with Lewis, uh, he was writing to uh, Lewis's supervisors in Washington, D.C. The conflict culminates in an ugly public scene. The secretary refuses to have anything to do with the governor, except during business hours. Why Lewis couldn't have simply fired Frederick Bates? Maybe it was because Frederick Bates had too much political clout in Washington. His father had been a political figure. He himself had uh, sort of a good ends with the administration in Washington. Remember now that we're passing out of Jefferson's presidency into his successor's presidency. A new set of bureaucrats, a new set of administrators have come in. People that aren't uh, perhaps as friendly to Lewis and may have some closer associations to Bates as well. The clash with Bates will cost Lewis dearly. But ironically, it will be Lewis who provides the weapon for his own destruction an invoice. Lewis was already in debt for a lot of things. The territory, Louisiana, was cash poor. So Lewis and people like him, people on the make, were doing almost all their business on credit. The federal government begins disallowing some of Lewis's expenses. One of them is a charge of $500, an enormous sum for the time, that Lewis had paid to return an Indian chief brought to Washington as part of the expedition back to his tribe. Now this was during a period in the United States when administrators were responsible for debts that they incurred of the federal government. So he was in real financial problems with these debts that they were turning back to him. News of the rejections is leaked, perhaps by Bates, to Lewis's many creditors. Lewis is distraught and turns to his friend Clark for counsel. I have not spent such a day as yesterday for many years. I took my leave of Governor Lewis, who set out to explain some matter between him and the government. Several of his bills have been protested and his creditors all flocking in distressed him much. If his mind had been at ease, I should have parted cheerfully. This then was the catalyst of Lewis's last journey. Not a heroic expedition of discovery, but a desperate effort to reason with Washington bureaucrats. It is a debilitating trip. On the way, Lewis makes out his will, leaving everything to his mother. By the time he reaches Fort Pickering, he seems physically, if not emotionally, near collapse. Later, the fort commander, Captain Gilbert Russell, 
will pass on a report claiming Lewis tried to kill himself during the river voyage and arrived in a demented state. There's no question that Meriwether Lewis uh, was a sick man when he arrived at Fort Pickering. And evidently he had been drinking. But we have to keep in mind uh, that alcohol was the, the liquid of choice on the Mississippi River and on the Natchez Trace. The most common belief is that he was suffering from malaria, which was almost endemic on the Mississippi River. Unquestionably, he had a fever and was uh, somewhat, as anyone would be with a high fever, a little bit out of his head. And malaria will uh, subside and will recur, and will subside and will recur. And I, in my view, that is the most likely possibility. Lewis, who served as medic on the expedition to the Pacific, tending his men's illnesses and injuries, is now medicating himself with a variety of nostrums. Most of these medicines uh, that they use to, uh, uh, to try to cure really uh, serious problems were opium-based they would build up in the bloodstream. Now, I don't know all the medical and pharmacological consequences of these sort of thing, and I can't speak to that. But I would feel that these would have a, uh, a damaging effect on the body and the mental capacities over time. We don't want mercury in our, in our fish supply and so on, because it can do serious damage, or there can be cerebral damage as well. And, of course, that could cause a situation where a person would be, quote, out of his mind by reason of mercury poisoning. Lewis recovers, and Captain Russell lends Lewis money and horses to continue the trip, accompanied by the Indian agent, Major Neely. Along the way, Neely later claims in his letter to Jefferson, the governor's mental state deteriorates. Left unattended, Lewis slides into madness, driven by drink, drugs, and problems both personal and professional. It is a tragic story, one that will be told by the survivors at Grinder's Stand again and again, and one that will change with each telling. Can faulty memories be blamed, or the confusion of the moment, or is there a less innocent explanation? In the spring of 1811, about a year and a half after the death of Meriwether Lewis, a lone traveler again comes to Grinder's stand. This time, the man is a backwoods ornithologist named Alexander Wilson. Intrigued by the stories of Lewis's death, he makes a point to visit Mrs. Grinder. For the first time, notes are taken as she tells her tale. Governor Lewis, she said, came about sunset and inquired if he could stay for the night. On being asked if he came alone, he said there were two servants behind who would soon be up. He called for some spirits, but drank very little. As the evening wears on, Lewis alternates between making polite conversation with Mrs. Grinder and pacing the floor, talking to himself. The agitated behavior, Wilson reports, continues even after the governor retires to his room. The woman, being considerably alarmed by the behavior of her guest, could not sleep, but listened to him walking backward and forwards, she thinks for several hours, and talking aloud like a lawyer. She describes Lewis as being disturbed and as speaking to himself and as getting red in the face. My take on this, as one who studied territorial history at great length, is that Lewis was absolutely uh, angry about what the officials in Washington were attempting to do to him. And I, I can just picture him right now practicing his remarks to those Washington bureaucrats and how he was going to argue his case. It's not difficult for me to imagine that his behavior was one of a man full of, of anger and full of frustration rather than a man who was crazy. In Wilson's account, Mrs. Grinder hears Lewis call out after the shots. She then heard the report of a pistol and the words, Oh Lord. Immediately afterwards, she heard another pistol, and in a few minutes she heard him at her door calling out, Oh Madam, give me some water and heal my wounds. Yet Mrs. Grinder does not summon the servants, as Neely reported. Instead, 
She watches through chinks in the logs as Lewis staggers and crawls around the yard, begging for water and aid. Mrs. Grinder indicated that I did not answer the knock at the door when Meriwell Lewis came to the door seeking water and my assistance for the wounds that he suffered. That tells us, one, that if he was a suicide, he had a change of mind after he had shot himself, or else he wasn't a suicide. It also tells us something about Mrs. Grinder. Ms. Grinder was a child of the frontier, growing up in the Carolinas and living in Tennessee. Tennessee was one of the bloodiest of all of America's frontiers in terms of the relations with Indians. She was used to violence. Uh, she was used to adversity. And her behavior, as she reports it, that is letting Lewis lay for hours in his own blood outside of her door, this is not the behavior of a good old frontier gal. The story just does not click. Only hours later, she tells Wilson, after sunrise, does she send her children to rouse the servants. There was no witness to this crime. The servants, supposedly, the two servants, were a hundred yards away. One wonders why the servants, sleeping in an open barn, were not awakened by the report of two pistol shots. These were rather large pistols, somewhere in the neighborhood of 45 caliber or greater. They would have made a lot of noise. Lewis is found in his room, mortally injured, his brains exposed by the head wound, but alert. Although Wilson's account is far more detailed than Neely's, there is one statement in the first that is missing from the second, the admission by Lewis that he has shot himself. He begged they would take his rifle and blow out his brains. He said, I am no coward, but I am so strong. It's so hard to die. He expired in about two hours. Some of the things that he is supposed to have done are just not scientifically, pathologically conceivable. And then indeed, after two shots, to areas that are very vascular, filled with blood, there would be extravagation of blood all over the place from him that he nevertheless could manipulate, could, uh, could perambulate around the site asking for water. This just doesn't stack up to a suicide situation. Those who believe he may have been murdered take issue with Lewis's supposed motives for suicide. True, he wanted a wife and had not found one. But how many millions of human beings have found themselves in that same predicament? He liked the girls, and, and frankly, what he was doing in Philadelphia was having a big time. He was on a dalliance, not a delay. He was wined and dined and adored and admired. Uh, surely he was having a good time. Uh, the idea that he was sitting alone in some room, moping over the fact that he didn't have a wife, that's pretty far-fetched to me. Proponents of suicide also suggest that uh, an indication of his intention to kill himself was the fact that in route down the Mississippi, he stopped and wrote a will, leaving all of his property to his mother. To me, that's a sign of discretion. Why would a man who originally intended to go on a long ocean voyage not write a will? The fact that he wrote a will indicates that he knew he had property worth giving to his mother. This is a strong argument about his being bankrupt. As a matter of fact, he stood to make some money on the investments that he had made. Yes, he had a cash flow problem, but no, he was not in financial distress. As for the governor's mental condition, those who suspect murder note that the reports of Lewis's erratic behavior came to light only after he was dead. His most uh, venomous enemy, Frederick Bates, never once, publicly or privately, as far as we can tell, uh, commented on Meriwether Lewis's state of mind or his uh, alcoholic, his suspected alcoholic uh, tendencies. Indeed, in 1814, Jefferson wrote about the disposition of his family towards uh, mental problems. But would Thomas Jefferson have assigned a known sufferer from emotional distress to lead what was to Thomas Jefferson at that moment, the most important expedition in the world. Another insanity rebuttal comes from Lewis himself. In the rational letters written from Fort Pickering, where Russell claimed he seemed deranged. 
I am proceeding by land through the state to Tennessee and to the city of Washington. I bring with me duplicates of my vouchers for public expenditures, which, when fully explained, I flatter myself will receive both sanction and approbation. But if Lewis was not despondent or irrational enough for suicide, who fired the fatal shots? Although Thomas Jefferson mourns his friend Meriwether Lewis as a suicide, not everyone accepts the verdict. Lewis's mother will maintain to the end of her life that Lewis was murdered. And in the years that follow Lewis's death, each person who saw him on that last fateful trip will be named as a suspect. Among the first, the man Lewis's mother names as his killer, his longtime servant, John Pernia. At the time of Lewis's death, Pernia is owed back wages in the amount of $240, the equivalent of nearly $4,000 today. Motive enough for robbery or murder? The second man to arouse suspicion is the Indian agent, James Neely, who first met Lewis at Fort Pickering. Just three months after Lewis's death, the fort's commander, Captain Russell, writes an outraged letter to Thomas Jefferson. I have lately been informed that James Neely has detained the pistols and perhaps some other of Governor Lewis's effects for some claim he pretends to have upon his estate. This Neely also says he lent the governor money, which cannot be, for he had none himself, and the governor had more than $100 in notes. Russell goes on to accuse both Neely and Bernia of pushing alcohol on Lewis. The fact that you may yet be ignorant of that his untimely death may be attributed solely to liquor. Instead of preventing the governor from drinking, Neely advised him to it, and from everything I can learn, gave the man every chance to destroy himself. I cannot help believing Pernia was rather aiding and abetting in the murder than otherwise. The money Lewis had with him, worth about $1,500 today, is never recovered. As for Lewis's pistols, a letter written by his brother in 1812 reports that Neely continues to carry the pistols on his person, refusing to return them to the family. On that final journey along the Natchez Trail, Lewis is traveling alone because the horses disappeared. Even if they had strayed, why was it so important for Major Neely not to look after Meriwether Lewis in the condition of ill health that he was at the time, but to go out after looking for two horses. Did Neely purposely let the horses stray or even arrange for them to be stolen as part of an alibi for robbery and murder? Or was he setting Lewis up for assassination? Who would have paid to see Lewis dead? A third theory points the finger at Frederick Bates, the man who will realize his long-held ambition to become governor, but only after Lewis dies. And if you are a believer in conspiracies, the idea that Frederick Bates uh, wanted him out of the way uh, makes a lot of sense. Frederick Bates, I hate to use the word despise, but he did despise uh, Meriwether Lewis. But the fourth and most popular theory is also the simplest. Lewis was murdered by a stranger, a robber who saw an opportunity. The Natchez Trace was certainly not uh, safe in 1809. As a matter of fact, the boatman who used the Natchez Trace to return up north always traveled in what we would call caravans. Seldom did a person, even in 1809, go up the Natchez Trace alone. Word of the presence of a man as important as Lewis would have spread up and down the trail. Travel in those days was expensive as it is now. He had money with him. Virtually all travelers had money with them. Being an extremely famous pers person, traveling in style, it would be a stupid robber who wouldn't pick him out as a target. But Lewis was also a crack shot and no easy mark. After all, much of the time that he was on the trail, he was in the company of, a, of an army officer uh, and two servants. He himself was well armed. He had a pair of pistols. He had a rifle. He had a tomahawk. 
he had a dagger. The logical time uh, to attack a person is when they're asleep. Because Grinder Stan was so isolated and was really one of the last stands before you get to Nashville, it would have certainly been a, a wonderful opportunity, maybe the last opportunity that a robber would have to catch him in such a vulnerable place. To those who subscribe to this theory, the grinders are innocent bystanders. They may know the local bandits and the potential for reprisal only too well. She didn't open that door to help her house guest overnight, a man of the stature of Mary with the Lewis. Why? Because she was frightened? Because there was a robber lurking out there that might kill her, as well as Mary with the Lewis? In addition to historical conjecture, there is also an oral tradition, Tennessee folklore passed down through the generations. In these, Mrs. Grinder and her husband are suspects. There are several versions of how that might have been. After all, according to her account, her husband was away at another farm, and she was alone. And some people suggest that perhaps uh, she was having a dalliance with, uh, with Marilla Lewis and the husband uh, returned uh, and, and in a moment of anger uh, shot, his, shot uh, uh, Marilla Lewis. There are other people who suggest that Mrs. Grinder shot Marilla Lewis because he was coming on too strong towards her. So the, the oral tradition has many versions of what happened. Another story steeped in local tradition maintains that Lewis did not die in a cabin at Grinder's stand, but was shot outside. Locals found evidence of a rifle patch and wadding near the Grinder barn, as if someone fired from that location. Adding credence to the story is a report by the local mail carrier, who swears he finds Lewis's body out on the trail itself. Is Mrs. Grinder's second version of events in which a wounded Lewis is crawling outside in the yard designed to match these reports? Ms. Grinder gave several different versions of her account. We can only use our imagination as to why she did this. Obviously, here's a woman uh, with uh, the most famous American of, of the day dead on her premises. I'm sure she was frightened and sad and needed some explanation and she did the best she could uh, in, in telling this story. And how did those present at the isolated cabin really deal with Lewis's repeated demands for medical attention? In Mrs. Grinder's second account, committed to writing by Alexander Wilson during his visit to Grinder's stand, Lewis is quoted as begging his servants to take a rifle and blow his brains out. Did someone oblige him? Or invent Lewis's plea to justify that second deadly shot? No one can say. Major Neely came up the next day. We really have no eyewitness account. It's all hearsay. And this is why we have so many different versions of what happened to Meriwether Lewis. Testimony changes over time and uh, in circumstances. People remember things differently. Uh, people uh, recall additional details as they go along. Modern testimony we've seen time and again is just as confused and just as different uh, as it happens over time. Well, it all solves so neatly on TV programs, but it doesn't always solve that neatly in real life. Perhaps none of the people at Grinder's stand that October morning knew for certain who fired the shots. But they must have realized that a charge of murder would focus suspicion on them all. Suicide, especially given the governor's recent behavior, may seem the most logical and prudent explanation. After all, there is no way of proving otherwise. Or is there? It is December of 1848. Nearly 40 years after the death of Meriwether Lewis, a long overdue monument is built by the Tennessee legislature. Its shape, a broken column, symbol of a life cut short. Before the monument can go up, 
The location of Lewis's body, buried in haste so long ago, must be confirmed. The grave is opened and the identification is made. During the process, one witness makes an intriguing report. The impression has long prevailed that under the influence of disease of body and mind, Governor Lewis perished by his own hand. It seems more probable that he died by the hands of an assassin. What prompts that statement? Hearsay? Popular opinion? Or some evidence still visible on the remains? It's a question many would like to explore. I came to the conclusion a long time ago that the only way we would end this argument would be to have a forensic examination of the remains of Marywella Lewis. Could modern criminal investigative techniques answer the question once and for all? What evidence could be left after nearly 200 years? The black powder in use in those days was not only putrid to the smell, but it also left, left a great deal of residue behind it. And we would expect to find, even 200 years later, such residue on the bone or even without the bone. Gunpowder around the injuries, indicating the shots were contact wounds, could confirm the finding of suicide. The presence of gunpowder elsewhere could point to murder. It could be that Mary Weather Lewis fought off his attacker. If he did, we would look very carefully on the arms, uh, especially on the arms, for what we call defense wounds. We would expect that he would be throwing his arms up in some way to protect himself. If we find gunshot residue across his arms, something is demonstrably wrong about the claim of suicide. The location of the entrance wounds could be equally revealing. If we find bullets from his back, going from the posterior, as we say, to the anterior, that clearly is not a suicidal wound. There's no way in which he could manipulate this cannon of a handgun and turn it around and try to shoot himself in the back, or indeed, without great difficulty, shooting himself in the back of the head. Why not just simply put it back to the head and shoot yourself in the head the second time if you're going to kill yourself? But there are those who are fiercely opposed to any such investigation. They also feel very strongly that his remains should not be exhumed. Now, in a sense, this might seem anti-intellectual. You're saying, well, don't you want the truth? Someone would ask, don't I want to know absolutely what happened? Well, sure, I'd like to know absolutely what happened, but I do not believe that bringing his remains to surface would answer those questions. The people who are convinced one way or another, especially those who believe in the murder theory, would not be convinced no matter what the evidence was. Conspiracy theories really never die. I think that really we should not bother these human remains, that we should let all these human remains, Lewis's and all of these historical figures, rest in peace. Without physical evidence, the debate over the death of Meriwether Lewis is certain to continue. His descendants want to see the speculation end. My father discussed how Meriwether Lewis was a great explorer and uh, we were all very proud to be one of uh, some of his descendants and I curious as I was at a young age wanted to know when he died and how he died and my father said well that's really a mystery we really don't know the answer to that question some people say that he committed suicide but we as a family really don't know Lewis has been characterized as perhaps a drug abuser alcoholic it's even been said that he suffered from venereal disease. We would like, as a family, to determine if any of these things are true before it's documented in history. We shouldn't think that because a man could p committed suicide at one point, that it sort of darkens the whole story of his life, that somehow he's less worthy. I think we have to accept that uh, even a man as brave and competent and accomplished as Lewis was one point in, in his life, at another point in his life, he can just be driven to the depths of despair and do this act upon himself. And today we don't uh, place the same type of stigma on suicide. In the early 19th century, suicide was considered a very cowardly act. 
It was considered a disgraceful act. Meriwether Lewis is one of the most important figures in the history of the United States in terms of our expansion to the Pacific, in terms of the fulfillment of our manifest destiny. I think we owe it to Meriwether Lewis as a person to resolve this mystery. I think we owe it to his descendants. And I think we owe it to the honesty of American history. We're willing to accept whatever forensic science may determine as regards to his death. In addition, we would like for Lewis to be afforded a Christian burial as he did not enjoy that benefit upon his death. But for now, Meriwether Lewis, explorer and scholar, adventurer and governor, rests below a monument that recalls not the circumstances of his death, but the nature of his life, expressed in the words of Thomas Jefferson. His courage was undaunted. His firmness and perseverance yielded to nothing but impossibilities. A rigid disciplinarian, yet tender as a father. Honest, liberal, with a sound understanding and a scrupulous fidelity to truth. And inscribed on the west side of the monument, the few truths that can be ascertained with any certainty. Meriwether Lewis, born near Charlottesville, Virginia, August 18, 1774. Died October 11, 1807, aged 35 years. The rest remains like so much of Lewis's life, uncharted territory, navigable only by those in search of truth and in search of history.